and welcome to another edition of Cultural Caravan TV. I'm your host, Rabi Nickens, and today we are at the Yale Club in New York City for a very special event. It is the launch of a multimedia groundbreaking documentary entitled The Changing Faces of Medicine. And this is an opportunity through this film to see the history, the challenges, and the triumphs of black women in the medical field. We will be joined by the filmmaker herself, artist and activist, Crystal Emery, who has a fantastic story of inspiration and determination in her own right, and will also be joined by her collaborator on this national initiative to get more black women into the medical field, former United States Surgeon General, Dr. Joycelyn Elders. Are you ready? I am, so let's go. My mom was doing my hair, we were watching TV, and I don't remember what was on TV, but somehow the subject came up of, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a doctor. And she said, you know, she's like, you want to be a doctor? He's like, you're so little, how do you know you want to be a doctor? And I said, because I want to help people. And, you know, it's kind of odd what three-year-old knows they want to be a doctor, but I would consider it a higher calling because it's something that I've always been passionate about, and I just went after it. I realized when I was about four years old that I wanted to be a doctor, and it was something that I pretty much knew I could do. It wasn't anything that I thought was unattainable. I said I wanted to be a doctor, just, I just said it, and they supported it. And I started high school, and I kept on saying it, and I kept on doing programs, and it just, you know, it fell into place. I had been sewing since I can remember. My mother was a seamstress, and she taught me to sew very well. So I knew I could stitch up a body better than some man who learned it last week and I decided I would be a surgeon. I can't think of anything else I would like, so by 12 I decided I wanted to become a doctor. I grew up in the era where you could either be a doctor, a lawyer, or anything else, <laughs> and my father was a physician, so doctor was always high on the list. Um, and cardiac surgery is really the most fun that you can have legally in the United States. I think I knew when I was a sophomore in college. I had never seen a doctor before I went to college. And you can't be what you can't see. Black women have a traditional history and responsibility for healing. Black women were the primary caregivers in many of the slave communities. I often go around and I speak to young people and I mentor a lot of people. And I like to mentor people and let them know, I try to be very open with my life. And I let them know that I grew up in the projects of a single family home. My, my mother raised us, um, five girls alone. Um, I got pregnant at 16. Um, I you know, then had four more children before getting married. So I had five children when I got married. I was everything people say you're not supposed to be. You know, I'm every stereotype, I was not supposed to make it. Not many women took the challenge of going beyond straight general surgery into a subspecialty. And so when you look at subspecialties in surgery, there are very few women, and there are also very few African-American women, because that in itself is a challenge, you know, trying to get through the glass ceiling beyond those careers that are viewed as uh, male-dominated fields, and certainly subspecialties in, medicine, in surgery are male-dominated. Female doctors have a really important role to play in identifying problems and needs of communities, of the communities that they come, come from. So they can play a very important role in terms of advocating um, for problems and concerns of their communities. I was raised by some fierce black women, and I learned from them, and also from my father, that number one, the main thing you have to do is believe in yourself, that you really have to believe that you can do it. So I grew up on the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. The young black female physicians that are emerging today can do anything they really want to do. Dr. Crystal Harrington. You are some of the smartest, most talented individuals going into anything in the world today. Dr. Antonia Francis. I want you to also think about as you become great and wonderful healers. Dr. Rochelle Patrice Yarborough. 
that that healing is not only for your patients, but it's for your community. It's for your nation. It's for the world. <laughs> here with producer, director, artist, filmmaker, and activist, Crystal Emery. Uh, Miss Emery, thank you so much for joining us here at Cultural Caravan TV. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, what inspired you to, to produce The Changing Faces of Medicine? I had the triumph of the human spirit. I met these wonderful women uh, that I was asked to interview. And I just thought their story was everything that encourages you to be a success. Mm -hmm. And that we don't ever see the story of courageous, you know, educated black women without there being a downside to that. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to share their story. Mm -hmm. So on we went with this journey. Mm -mm. And here we are, five years later, about to be released on American public television. Yes, yes. And I know that this is part of like an ongoing tour for the, the, the film, but up until this point, what has been the reaction to the film for the audiences that, that have seen it thus far? I think across the country it's been great. Okay. You know, whether it's an interracial audience, whether it's an all-black um, urban community audience, whether it's higher education, uh, medical schools, um, it's needed. You know, we need to find a safe space to talk about these issues in a way that isn't harmful, but opens people to a different way to look at themselves. And so this offers that opportunity. Yes, getting getting our stories out there told, uh, which is often difficult to do. Um, we were talking before we started the interview about some of the statistics about um, black women in education and being one of the most educated groups in the country, yet there's this disparity, uh, as you found in the film, about the amount of black women doctors. So what are some of the, the reasons that surfaced for that um, in the film? Well, I, I would dare that statistic and not knowing where it came from. Mm. Um, I don't think that we are the most educated minorities because education has been extremely difficult mm. for blacks in America. Mm. And then you have to, that word minority is a very interesting word mm. um, because you're not saying black American. Um, minority encompasses a lot of different types. Um, but. Some of the problems, and particularly with black women, are the same problems that all women face. You know, white women still receive less than a white man uh, for their work, and black women receive less than a white woman. And so you're dealing with sexism, you're dealing with racism, you're dealing with economics, you're also dealing where they were educated. You know, you are more likely to get a better job if you have a PhD from Yale than from Phoenix University. Mm. Mm. So all of those um, come together to create the dilemma that we're in today. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying, all those different factors and the intersectionality of gender and race um, uh, that black women have to, to deal with as well. Um, but you yourself, as, a, as an African-American female, have probably had to deal with a lot of some, uh, some of the similar uh, um, challenges that they have faced as well. But at the same time, you put this film out uh, thinking about all the things that you've done in terms of uh, the other films, the books that you've written. Um, you're truly a role model and an, an inspiration for a lot of people in terms of just your vision, your determination, um, I was really struck by a quote that you that you had said. You said, I am not and cannot be defined by other people's limitations. Can you expand for, on that for our audience? Like, what, what made you say that? Like, what in your experiences, you know, in, it made, made that something that you had to say and believe? You know, I grew up in what is called a housing project. Mm. And yet, Brookside... I thought I grew up in a condominium 
on a nature preserve, mm. right? Because it was very beautiful where I grew up. Okay. And the projects were very beautiful. And I lived on a dead end street. So we knew everybody. It was also interracial. So I did not grow up with normal boundaries of white, black, yellow. I grew up in a community, a real community, where Mr. Polanski came home, or Mrs. Reynolds, or whoever it was. And so it wasn't until later that somebody told me I was poor and black. And I, they said, you live in the projects. And I was like, what is your problem? I don't live in the projects, I live in Brookside. I learned by 10 that other people would define you through their kaleidoscope. And I wasn't going to allow what you thought about who I should be or what I should be. And it would be later that that foundation would serve me well. Now that I'm in a wheelchair, when I walk into a room, people, I mean, I have a husband. And I walk into a room, they call him my son, even though he's eight years older than me. They call him the home health aide, you know, anything but husband. So when people see me, they see black woman, wild hair, wheelchair, and they bring to the table a set of, of prejudices. Um, and I'm not going to let anybody define my capableness by their limitations. Mm. I just am not. Mm, mm. I don't come from people like that. Mm. It sounds like you were really blessed with a strong background, a strong family base, um, even a strong community base. Um, would you say that that's the main place where you draw your strength to be able to do this? Because there's so many people, especially in our audience, that have faced the same sort of misperceptions, um, and whether it's in regards to their appearance or what. Uh, your, your twists are everything, by the way. I don't know what they're talking about, but anyway. <laughs> but, but I mean, so, so somebody might be looking at this and say like, oh, Oh, that sounds great, but like, how can I do that? Like, what can I do to try to overcome other people's perceptions when there's, it's so daunting? My grandmother believed in God, and God is a personal experience. Now, what I've come to learn is when you believe in something bigger than yourself, all that other crap is very little. Mm. That there is a power greater than I, do I know what that power really is? No. But what I do know is that the only person that I can be responsible for is me and my behavior. Mm. And that if I do the best that I could do, and that's why I love Dr. Elders. You know, she always says, honey, if you did the best you could do today and you did it with the right heart, you're good. Mm. And you know, you have to believe in that inner teacher. You know, so many times we go to do something and something tells us, don't do that. And even today, I turned down 46th Street because GPS had turned down 46th. And I knew better. <laughs> I knew better right. than it took 40 minutes. You have an inner teacher. Mm -hmm. We all possess that. I used to say to my grandmother, could you talk to God for me? And she would say, sweetie, everybody has that phone number. And I would say, yeah, Nana, but some people don't know how to dial it. <laughs> we do know how to dial it. And it is that saving grace that at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, you know, makes my understanding of the world greater than this moment, greater than this city, greater than our country, um, and I'm part of that. So all that other stuff, listen, if you want to dislike me because I'm black or overweight or whatever, you know what? That's on you. Mm. That is on you. But I'm not going to let your insecurities define who I am. Mm. And I get to choose that. Mm. Mm. That's my power. Mm. And it's good. It's good. 
And I, and I actually think the opposite is gonna happen when people see this film. They're gonna love you for what you've presented and brought to the fore. Um, just what would you like uh, for the impact to be of this film on future generations? I mean, so much of what you shared had to do with uh, wisdom passed down from other generations in your family to you. What would you like the impact of this work, uh, Changing Faces of Medicine, to be on future generations? Well, you know what, it works like this. We are capturing history. We're also creating history. Mm. And we want to propel it to the future. It's multidimensional. When we are at medical schools, we are touching the hearts and the minds of admission officers and deans to see people, black people, in a different way. Mm. When we are in the community, we are touching parents and children. When I bring the doctors to a screening, many kids tell us, last night in Chicago, I've never seen a black doctor before. Wow. Okay? You can't be what you can't see. Mm. And so we encourage the child to dream big. We encourage the parent, regardless of your circumstances, don't put those limitations on your children. Mm. And we encourage the educational, our mainstream America that changes here. And you can either join it or step aside, because we, we are here. We have arrived. So. Well, on that note, those powerful words, Miss Crystal Emery, thank you so much for your contributions, and thank you for sharing yourself with our viewers in Cultural Caravan TV. Thank you so much, Namaskar. Yes. Thank you. Yes, we are joined by scholar, inspiration, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. Welcome to Cultural Caravan TV. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Elders, you have been an inspiration and a role model as the first African-American United States Surgeon General. Uh, what was your inspiration for entering the medical field? You know, I had never seen, even seen a doctor, or even knew about doctors until I, my, I was a freshman in college. And at that time, I met a Dr. Edith Irby Jones, okay. who was the first black student to attend the University of Arkansas. And she was, I thought she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And, and she was so charming. And I had graduated from high school not knowing what I was going to do and feeling that if I got, got a job working at Dillard's store as a clerk, that would get me out of the cotton patch. Okay. And I, it's since I'd never seen a doctor, we, had, we didn't have any running water, we didn't have lights, mm. we didn't have indoor privy. So, I couldn't see anybody on TV, mm. so you can't, didn't hear them on radio, and you can't be what you can't see. So my inspiration was hearing Dr. Edith Irby Jones talk about the difference between the high road and the low. And she says, in the between on the misty paths, the rest walk to and fro. And I was so impressed. I was a sophomore in college at that time, but from that moment on, all I could think about is I wanted to be just like Dr. Edith Irby Jones. Mm. All it took was that one person for you to actually see, uh, just like what you said, you can't be what you can't see and look at the, the, the career that it set you on and the path um, to, to attain the, 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 the position of attorney, uh, of a Surgeon General. Yes. Um, because you yourself um, are somebody that represents something that we can see, somebody could say that in and of itself was your contribution, yet you chose to be a part of this film, The Changing Face of Medicine. What inspired you to actually embark on this collaboration with uh, Crystal Emery, the filmmaker? I think what inspired me was Crystal Emery herself. I feel that, it, first of all, I feel that the fact that she was putting together this important historical 
uh, da data on black women in medicine mm. and talking about changing the face of medicine. That really inspired me because it was not cataloged any place. Right. But the second was the fact that if someone with crystal disability could work as hard as she's worked to pull us all together and put this film together, I was totally motivated to do whatever I could to make it a success. I wanted it to be a success because I felt that our young people needed it. But more than that, I was impressed and moved by her. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so much that your work as an advocate and Crystal Emery's work as a filmmaker is doing. Uh, I, I come back to that whole, you can't be what you can't see. Um, and we're seeing you and we're seeing Crystal Emery um, doing these things to make those stories told. Uh, what can we do as a community who, if you're not a filmmaker or you're not a prestigious doctor yeah, right. such as yourself, what can we do um, to inspire more African Americans in general and, and females Ooh. in particular to enter the medical profession? Well, well, I think that the fact that you're talking to Emory, talking to me, and encourage, talking to other women doctors and, and putting it out before the public, that's how we learn. I feel that you as a journalist or you know, as a really trans can help transform how we think mm. and how we see ourselves. And the more you put that out before us, the more we be will begin to feel good about ourselves and begin to feel that we can climb to the top of the ladder and make sure when you get up there that you send it back down for the people at the bottom so they can make it. And that to me is wh what you can do is always, you know, when you find po positive stories about some young person who's out there doing something, to talk about what they can do and encourage them. Because I didn't know I could be a doctor. It never even occurred to me in my wildest dreams. I had never even seen a doctor. So how could I plan on being a doctor? Mm -hmm. And when you see so many young people, they've been planning to be a doctor all their lives. But because of people like yourself now. <laughs> well. And <laughs> in, in, in uh, Crystal well, Emery. Um, well, yes. You know, when you think about it, I have, I'm the oldest of eight, I have eight siblings, or seven siblings, and myself, there are eight of us. Okay. And I'm the oldest, and my brother often says, but I never even thought much of it, he often says, he says, you know, he says, it's because you got out there and blazed the trail mm. so we could follow. And so out of my eight sisters and brothers, you know, from a very poor family who we lived in a shack, we didn't even have electricity or running water or indoor plumbing. Right. So, but you know, I have a brother who's, uh, you know, who was a veterinarian, oh, really? a, a, a brother who was secretary for race and religion for the United Methodist Church for the entire world. Oh. And so, so we didn't know any of these things. Well, yes. well, but, and then, uh, you know, and I have a sister who was on the faculty. She was a linguist at Howard University. Mm -hmm. And I have another brother who was, who's a, a mechanic. He's an engineer of sorts, and he helped build race car, these super race cars. Mm -hmm. So, and then my, bro my brother, who I'm most proud of, he really didn't read very well. Okay. And he worked for General Motors for 53 years. And in 53 years, he missed three days of work. Amazing. That, to <laughs> me, was just absolutely amazing. It does. And, and so, I, so I'm really very proud of the, you know, of the, the things they've done. And as I said, and my sister, who I've Feel, I'm talking about my family, but my sister, whom, whom I felt was the smartest of all of us. You, you know, if you just, you, we, well, well, you know, a, a she ended up being a teenage mom, okay. and she had four children, but she worked for Ford for 
30, 40 years. Right. But, but now she, she had a stroke two years ago. And so we've been encouraging her, my brother and I. But, you know, she has just designed so many little tips that would make a difference for people that are handicapped. Yes. And, and, and I, we've been insisting that she write, was, we said, well, just write it down. Just put it down. We'll write it up. We'll get it right. But, but yeah, she is just so smart. And thank you for joining us for another edition of Cultural Caravan TV. As always, we encourage you to call, write, and tell a friend. Hit us up on our website at www.ccptv.org or also tweet us on Twitter. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.